Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Erwin. And thank you to the students, staff, and faculty of Gannon University for having me here with you tonight, as well as the community members, uh, alumni, friends, and family joining us on campus and virtually. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, and especially Dr. Richard and Cindy Orlando. Without you, this important lecture series would not be possible. I'm so honored to be part of it. And I also want to thank everyone who walked behind the scenes, Suzanne and uh, Suzanne, uh, Jane, everyone, those who did, who prepared the meals and who did the cleaning, everyone, those who designed this building, who built it, thank you. Because you're continuing con the work of God in creating spaces of life and healing for all. Good. So the title of my lecture today is A Case for Eucharistic Approach to Healthcare According to the Social Teachings of the Catholic Church. I forgot to turn on my mic. I'm a bad student. They didn't listen to the instructions correctly. <laughs> okay. So caring for another person in a time when they are in most need of such tender presence and support speaks to a calling that goes beyond the simple embrace of a job. A calling or vocation entails the giving of oneself to all that the situation demands of the person. It demands of one to constantly read the signs of the times so that the demands of the moment can be fully met. It is on that note that I can make the conclusion that a career in healthcare goes beyond the performative rituals of a job. In a capitalist society as ours, where sometimes a person's worth is measured by how much wealth or power they have over others, we may tend to forget that the correct engagement with the pneumatological reading of the signs of the times calls for a holistic way of being, of viewing the human person as one who transcends material wealth and political power. It entails an embrace of the human person in all its expressions in society. An embrace of a calling within the healthcare profession also allows for one to become what I have termed a Eucharistic icon that is oriented towards all that one encounters in such a profession. In this lecture, I intend to shed light on what a Eucharistic approach to healthcare looks like and how healthcare practitioners can embrace such an orientation through the lens of the social teachings of the church. I will make the case that the social teachings of the church are grounded in an anthropological vision that is rooted in an ethical commitment to the well-being of others that is Eucharistic all the way. And I want to begin my conversation with you by exploring the, reading the theme, reading the signs of the times. The role of an institution, whether secular or faith-based, is to constantly read the signs of the times. For faith-based institutions like Gannon University, reading the signs of the times is itself a pneumatological orientation to the world that allows for them to hear the cries, lamentations, hopes, and joys of those around them, especially those in need of transformative encounters in their lives. It involves being open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, who inspires and educates all to be more aware of the issues facing our world in a manner that demands an ethical response. Diane Bergat gets it right when she writes about this pneumatological orientation to otherness in light of the summons to all Christians in the Second Vatican Council. And I quote her, one of the most exacting challenges from the Second Vatican Council was, to su was its summons to read the signs of the times. It was a call to reflect deeply on the events unfolding before our eyes and to respond to them out of mature faith. This was difficult because many of us were accustomed to react to life rather than interact with it. And few of us possessed what today might be called mature faith. We probably knew the teachings of the church and we were well grounded in genuine devotion, but we were passive rather than actively involved in critical thinking about faith." Unquote. Reading the signs of the times is not just an option for, help for believers in Christ or anyone who embraces a vocation that brings life to all the encounter through their calling. Rather, it is a summons, 
one that inherent, inherently is linked to a sense of being in the world. In other words, to read the signs of the times is itself to be faithful to one's calling in life. This theme is central to the social teachings of the church. Though the concept, reading the signs of the times, was articulated fully and given a theological framework during the Second Vatican Council, its embrace and usage in the life of the church predates the council. In fact, one can argue that it is rooted in the Gospels. The mission of Christ is oriented towards the reading of the signs of the times. Hence, the Johannine Gospel locates the ministry of Christ within the matrix of life giver. And I quote, I come so that they may have life and have it ab more abundantly. John chapter 10, verse 10. Being attuned to the human condition as one in need of redemption, God becomes one with us in all things except sin in order to journey with us, suffer with us, and liberate us from all that holds us captive, especially that which diminishes human life in God's world. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. In the context of healthcare, one can also make the claim that reading the signs of the times calls for a close observation of one's world. Hence, the Hippocratic Oath is a summons to those in the healthcare profession to take seriously their obligations and duties of being agents of life to those who suffer from bodily ailments. Just as Jesus Christ's mission is rooted in his agency as a source of life for all, so also is one who takes on the tenets of the Hippocratic Oath. Among the obligations in the Oath is the demand for the healthcare practitioner to work for the benefit of the sick and to abstain from every voluntary act of mischief." Unquote. In such a manner that these interactions the practitioner has with the sick person will hopefully lead to a restoration of health. Reading the signs of the times is a key aspect of the healthcare profession. It is not just an orientation towards otherness. Rather, it is at the core of the profession. To truly embrace one's calling as a healthcare professional, one has to orient oneself towards the world of encounter where the other becomes the source of the gift of awareness and the summons to the ethical responsibility for all that one does. In other words, it is a litmus test for how one practices the profession. This way of being forces one to reject all forms of passivity in the face of suffering, especially when such suffering is caused by structures of evil operating in one's social context. In the context of the United States of America, a closer look at our society forces one to make the following statement. Is this nation serious about attending to the needs of its citizens in matters related to health care? In a 2018 article by Jerry Yanelli for the Miami New Times, it's good I cite your community. While citing the health care data from the Commonwealth Fund, notes that the state of Florida ranked 49th overall, third worst in America in matters related to health care, access and affordability, prevention and treatment, and the disparity between rich and poor. The article further explains that the state ranked 47th in the nation when it came to adults who are without health care coverage due to its cost, and 45th in the nation for adults without a usual source of care. 44th for disparity in rich, poor adults who report poor health, 50th for hospital readmissions and Medicaid reimbursements per person, and 51st for gap in rich poor hospital readmissions. That is people going to the hospital, leaving, and then needing more care later because they weren't cured. It is common knowledge in contemporary America that access to health care has become a political issue that is used for getting out the votes, especially when it is election season. While not trying to locate this lecture within the matrix of that politics, it is important to also shed light on some data on healthcare nationally. According to the nonpartisan website usafacts.org, in 1987, 87.1% of Americans were covered by either a public or private healthcare insurance. In 2020, the percentage rose to 91.4%. 
Also, in 1987, 75.5% of Americans had private health insurance. The number fell to 66.5% in 2020. As it pertains to public health insurance, in 1987, 23.3% of the population had government-sponsored health insurance, whereas in 2020, it rose to 34.8%. For the population without health insurance, in 1987, it was 12.9% of the country's total population. In 2020, the number fell to 8.6%. When it comes to race and ethnic demographics, the data is not consistent because some racial groups have no data before 20, 2002. However, in 2002, 90.6% of whites are, who are non-Hispanic had government-sponsored or private health insurance. In 2020, it rose to 94.6%. In 2002, 83% of the Asian population had government-sponsored or private health insurance. And in 2020, it was 94.1%. In, twen in 2002, 81.2% of blacks had government-sponsored or private health insurance. And in 2020, it rose to 89.6%. In, in 2002, 69.2% of Hispanics or any race had government-sponsored or private health insurance. And in 2020, it rose to 81.7%. Why, Why am I stating all these facts? I'm convinced that this report shows that good policies that focus on the common good in the well-being of, in this case, the well-being of the citizens of a nation tend to yield better results. Nonetheless, one has to also wonder why the nation has not yet achieved 100% insurance coverage for all its citizens. Forget for one minute the distractions that the political parties in the United States use to stall and sometimes prevent policies that will benefit every American. Courage to do the good and grounding public policies on the principle of the common good leads to a satisfied citizenry. Though it is not my intent to double into the quagmire of the culture wars playing out in the country around access to some forms of reproductive health care, one cannot but speak to the culture of debt that has held all of us captive in this country. On one hand, we have very politically involved groups advocating for either the right of a woman to decide what happens to her body, and on the other hand, we have those advocating for the right to life of a fetus. None of these groups ever seem to ask themselves, how do we embrace a culture of life that protects all the life in our society? without falling into the binary mindset of either or approach to the issues at stake. Here I am asking a prophetic question. What is pro-life when many in our nation have no access to good water? Flint, Michigan is no longer on the news because it is not a viable option to gain votes for winning the presidential election, as was the case some years ago. When black and brown lives are easily dispensable in our nation's history and culture, one has to ask again the same question, how do we understand life? When we sp spend so much money constructing weapons against non-existing enemies, because we have chosen to embrace a paranoid state of being as a nation, one has to ask again, well, how do we understand life? In a country that spends hundreds of billions of dollars building advanced weapons and reshaping the global politics to favor its so-called national interest, while millions of Americans live in poverty. One has to ask the question again, how do we understand life? The statistics on poverty in the United States shows that in 2019, 33.98 million Americans were living in poverty. Also, in 2019, 6.55 million American families were living in poverty. These numbers make up 7.8% of the total percentage of American families. In 2020, 11.4% of the United States population was living in poverty. These statistics do not yet reflect the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on the nation's uh, economy. Yet, when these facts are brought up, we have become accustomed to the narrative of who is going to pay for it. We are becoming a socialist country. But we never ask 
ourselves. Who paid for the $801 billion defense, dollars defense budget for 2021? Or the $777.7 .7 billion defense spending for 2022? I guess it fell from the sky. Poverty is itself a structural sin. It is human made. It comes from a false sense of self that is crafted at the expense of the well-being of others. Steve Barton states it better when he writes, in the case of poverty, social sin operates through false shared beliefs, unquote. Our collective embrace of a false way of being human in the world continues to perpetuate the cycle of poverty in our country. Individualism is not an authentic way of being human in God's world. Whether one is religious or not, individualism is itself an inhuman way of existing. Biologically, exper experientially, and culturally, the human person is radically relational. It finds its sense of self and purpose in the world by being with other beings. Individualism is isolationism. We have all seen the consequence of our false philosophy of being play out in the recent pandemic that has held our world captive. The request to wear masks and social distance while we all figure out how to address the pandemic failed woefully in this country. When an elected official in Texas argues that grandma and grandpa are willing to die to ensure that the economy does not collapse, one wonders if such a person understands the dignity of life. That is the argument behind the pro-life movement in this country. A return to the basics is needed today in our country and world in general. One that centers the flourishing of all lives in our world and not just those of the rich and powerful. I'm not against wealth. Wealth made us to be in this room if used properly. To embrace a holistic way of being human in the world, we ought always to look at healthcare as all encompassing. Our practice of healthcare should always address issues dealing with education, the environment, cultural and religious practices and beliefs, and social norms, because the human body never exists in isolation. Let me briefly engage the axiom of the Roman poet Decimus Junius Juvenalis who popularly known in, in English as Juvenal, as a tool to unpack the claim I am making here. Juvenal got it right when he wrote the following, Men sana in corpore sano, a healthy mind in a healthy body. When we weaponize illiteracy and strategically use it to control the citizenry as has been the history of education in the United States, when we think only of ourselves and see others as a threat, when we insist on constructing a society through the lens of racial hierarchy that presents some humans to be more human than others, we end up with an enduring culture of sickness and death. The body does not only exist within webs of relationships. Some good and some bad, it also remembers the past. You all know that better, better than I do in your profession. For example, and I quote, American Indians and Alaska natives throughout North America suffered devastatingly high rates of health disparities, many of which are linked to land loss, cultural devastation, and the lack of access to healthy environments. Uh, these communities' poor health is manifested in disproportionately high rates of chronic and communicable diseases, coupled with inadequate living conditions, insufficient nutrition, and exposure to high levels of environmental contaminants, unquote. Our bodies are bodies of history. Let's not forget that. They reveal our past, even those pasts we may not want to be conscious of. Our focus on healthcare should begin with an attempt to understand how our collective histories have played out. Ignoring this past is, all, is to allow ourselves to perpetuate further the enduring traumas of our past. This is why it is both laughable and unfortunate to see what is playing out in our country and world today. A conscious attempt to redact history in order to preserve our thin skin comfort that allows us to lie to ourselves as we fabricate stories that have no referential truths to them, except in our imaginations. All this said, 
In the next section of this lecture, I want to explore how the social teachings of the church can serve as a tool for embracing a holistic approach to healthcare that is much needed in our world today. And I, t I titled that section, Reading the Social Teachings of the Church as an Invitation to Embrace a Eucharistic Vision of the Human Person. The realities of the Industrial Revolution that brought to light the conflict between labor and capital led the church to discern closely the signs of the times. As it were, it allowed the church to seek solutions to unfamiliar and unexplored problems. The solution offered by the pontiff Leo XIII in his papal encyclical Rerum Novarum offers an anthropological vision that is intended to correct the notions of scarcity inherent in the new realities of our era that tends to present the relationship between the economic factors of demand and supply as one radically defined by scarcity. Scarcity is invented, and it is invented for control. This notion of scarcity has at its core a bankrupt anthropology, in the sense that the human person is forced into an existential competition with other forces, including other human beings, in order to have access to goods that will bring about its flourishing. In other words, this rendition of scarcity as inherently defining the economic system that the human person is thrown into allows for tensions and struggle for domination between those considered to be agents of capital and those who are labored producers of labor. Such a struggle is thus given an ethical validity because it is seen as a natural disposition of human life in society. Hence, Leo XIII offers the following insights in his encyclical as a response to this type of social anthropology. And I quote him. The great mistake made in regard to the matter now under consideration is to take up with the notion that class is naturally hostile to class, and that the wealthy and the working men and women, I'm adding that I like to be very inclusive in my language, uh, and also non-binary, are, in, are intended by nature to live in mutual conflict. So irrational and so false is this view that the direct contrary, the direct contrary is the truth. Just as the symmetry of the human frame is the result of the suitable arrangement of the different parts of the body, so is in a state is it ordained by nature that these two classes should dwell in harmony and agreement. So as to maintain the balance of the body politic, each needs the other. Capital cannot do without labor, nor labor without capital. Mutual agreement results in the beauty of good order, while perpetual conflict necessarily produces confusion and savage barbarity. One can make the bold claim that at the heart of the church's social teaching is a growing vision of the human person intended to bring about the flourishing of all humans. To buttress this claim, one has to look closely at some of the encyclicals that fall under the church's social teachings. For example, in the papal encyclical, Quadragesimo Anno, well, Pope Pius XI makes the following claim. I was reminded by my dearest friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Dart, not to mention uh, Pius XII today, so I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> it's an internal joke we have when we're in grad school together. <laughs> yeah. So, I quote Pius XI, with all our strength and effort, we must strive that at least in the future, the abundant fruits of production will accrue equitably to those who are rich and will be distributed in ample sufficiency among the workers. Not that these may become remis in work, for man, for man and woman, everyone is born to labor as the bird to fly, but that they may increase their property by thrift that they may bear by wise management of this increase in property. The burdens of family life with greater ease and security and that emerging from an insecure lot in life in whose uncertainties non-owning workers are cast, they may be able not only to endure the vicissitudes of earthly existence, but have also assurance that when their lives are ended, they will provide in some measure for those they leave after them." Unquote. Here, Pius XI 
insists that the duty of institutions, including the church itself, is to promote the common good and the flourishing of all persons. He summons to all in the world to be in solidarity with each other in a manner that each human being is given the opportunity to flourish will be renewed by the conciliar document Gaudium et Spes. Here, the church makes a bold statement by moving away from a paranoid state of existence that characterized it since the Reformation, when it saw itself as being under attack by the ideologies playing out in the world and its vision of the world as a world radically defined by sin. Gaudium et Spes is the hermeneutic pathway for the church to open itself to all that is in the world. In fact, the world is presented as inherently good because it is the stage where the drama of salvation plays itself out. As well as the continuous embrace of the mission of the Spirit to sustain God's people and all of creation until the end of times. Consequently, the conciliar document Gaudium et Spes reiterates an anthropological vision that is rooted in, a, in transformative solidarity of believers in Christ with all of humanity in such a manner that both the followers of Christ and those they are in solidarity with will experience their humanity as a gift that comes from God and one that is inherently oriented towards otherness, a being that is constituted ontologically as being with others. Lest the followers of Christ forget they are calling and the new humanity they embody in Christ through the waters of baptism, the document begins with the following insights, and I quote, the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of men, people of this age, especially those who are poor in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts for theirs is a community composed of human beings. United in Christ, they are led by the Holy Spirit in their journey to the kingdom of their Father, and they have welcomed the news of salvation which is meant for every person. That is why this community realizes, which is the church, realizes that it is truly linked with humankind and his history by the deepest of bonds. Therefore, the council focuses its attention on the world of humans, the whole of human family, along with the sum of those realities in the midst of which it lives. That world which is the theater of humankind's history and salvation." Unquote. The following points ought to be stressed as they pertain to the above quote from the document. First, the gift of salvation is grounded in solidarity between the new community of the followers of Christ that constitute, constitute the church. Applying this point to what I have stated above, that the false notion of scarcity that is used to define the economic order, which is then used to justify unhealthy competition between the rich and the poor, while upholding the praxis of manipulation and avarice as virtues to be embraced in the social order and the economic system playing out in it, the conciliar position of the church is to state clearly that solidarity involves the total embrace of one community by the other without exception. Hence, the rich, the healthy, and the powerful all have to find their purpose of being only through solidarity with the poor, the sick, and the weak in society. To be human in society is to embrace radical solidarity. This view is not limited to the conciliar teaching of the church. Now I want to turn to my homeland, my continent. We find it expressed in African praxis of Ubuntu. To be a person in African cultural thought is to be in radical solidarity with others. Others refer to all of creation. In African thought, everything is alive and only have a purpose of being when it is seen as being in solidarity with other beings. Have a Sindima and Placid temples both capture this view in their respective insights. Sindima writes, I quote, all life, that of people, plants, and animals, and the earth, originates and therefore has an intimate relationship of bondedness with divine life. All life is divine life, unquote. 
Tempels, while writing about the Bantu people of Sub-Saharan Africa, notes the following. The Bantu cannot conceive of the human person as independent standing on his own. Every human person, every individual is, as it were, one link in a chain of vital forces. A living link, both exercising and receiving influence, a link that establishes the bond with previous generations and with the forces that support his own existence. The individual is necessarily an individual adhering to the clan, unquote. Solidarity, as understood within the social teachings of the church and in African cultural thought, goes beyond a mental openness towards the other. Rather, it involves using one's gifts and talents to help others succeed and flourish in life. Relating this to healthcare, solidarity entails using one's skills and talents to help those who are sick to experience wholeness. It involves putting the well-being of others over the desire to make profit. And at the end of the day, nothing is more ethical than helping a human being to flourish in life, especially when the person is in need of healing. Second, salvation goes beyond the spiritual realm. It is radically inclusive of all persons and all of creation, both the sacred and the profane. The Johannine Gospel puts the following words in the mouth of Jesus. I came so that they might have life and have it more abundantly. With this in mind, salvation is radically concretized in the flourishing of life by God's creatures. To speak of salvation is to instantiate the well-being of the human person in community with other beings. It is to walk towards the flourishing of all of God's creatures. It is to take seriously and to address all that limit the flourishing of life, whether human-made or infused in an error of nature that can be corrected through human intelligence without directly or indirectly affecting the common good. Simply stated, salvation is holistic in all its expressions. It is not coincidental that the Latin word for salvation, salus, is the same word for healing. Spiritual salvation is not devoid of bodily healing. The link between the healing of the spirit and that of the body allows for salvation to be understood through the, a liberational lens. Jesus did not come to save just the soul or spirit of fallen humans. Rather, Christ came to be a voice for healing for all, of all that experience disease, whether spiritual, social, or bodily. Consequently, healthcare profession is a vocation that is aligned closely to the vision of Christ for all, being agents of abundant life for all. Without appealing to religion, a healthcare professional ought to constantly ask themselves the following question, how do I show up as an agent of life to ensure that all whom I encounter experience healing and thus flourish? This question involves being aware of and actively working against the structures of debt that play out in society. A healthcare practitioner cannot sit on the fence while structures of death define the lives of people around them. They must always embrace the prophetic life if they are to be true to their calling. By prophetic, I mean an intentional engagement with the issues affecting society and working towards the dismantling of structures of marginality playing out in society as well. Third, the content of salvation is itself a gift, one that comes from outside of the one receiving the gift. Though not stated clearly, reading the opening words of the conciliar document, Gaudium et Spes, one immediately sees an appeal to otherness as the locus for the discovery of oneself, either as a person or as a collective group like the church. In other words, to understand what the church is and its mission in the world, one must look beyond the horizon towards the other. Otherness is the locus of identity and mission, both for the church and for each person in the world. Emmanuel Levinas states this succinctly when he argues that subjectivity is inherently found in a going outside of oneself that is addressed at the other. The stranger, thinking the other person, is a part of the irreducible concern for the other. Love is not consciousness, Levinas will argue. It, rather, it is because there is a vigilance before the awakening 
that the cogito is possible, I'm still quoting Levinas, so you know, he writes in a very abstract way, <laughs> it's possible, so that ethics is before ontology. You are not a human person in isolation, you become human because you are ethical. And that's what Levinas is saying. The I does not arise. The I only arises in the encounter with the other who is different in their fragility and their presence of the other, which is not a presence but a trace. The other demands from the subject, thou shall not kill me. So you now have an identity of subjectivity to be responsible for the other. In the context of healthcare, the skills and talents that a healthcare professional has are only relevant because of the other who is in need of them. No gift, talent, or skill has any value or significance unless it serves the well-being of others. Healthcare is radically about being there for others. With this understanding, a sense of gratitude and hospitality ought to define how healthcare practitioners relate to their patients. The three points discussed above serve as the basis of what I have termed a Eucharistic vision of the human person. The Eucharist is central to the Christian life because it serves both as a guide and the end of the Christian life. Without downplaying the relevance and theology the church has offered with regard to the Eucharist, I do think that the Eucharist offers the church an anthropological vision that speaks to the type of human we have become by eating the body and blood of the incarnate Christ. All the ritual movements in the Eucharist speak to this fact. From the gathering of the believers of Christ to the offering of gifts made from human labor and gifted to us by nature, down to the sending forth of the members of the assembly to the communities they come from, the Eucharist centers a vision of the type of humanity Christ has given us and commanded us to embrace if we are to fully become Christ's followers. In the Eucharist, a Christian discovers herself or himself as a member of the community of believers. In other words, individualism is rejected as a form of identity marker within the context of Eucharistic identity. Rather than an embrace of individualism, an ethical turn to radical solidarity is preferred by the Eucharistic summons. Hence, each person comes to the space where solidarity and community is enacted on multiple levels. With one voice and embracing collective gestures of gratitude, thanksgiving, repentance, contrition, and petition, all pray to the Trinitarian God of fellowship. It is on this basis that the church rightly states that at its core is the spirit of koinonia, communion. In other words, the church in its constitutive essence is a community. Individualism is rejected because it instantiates the fragmentation of life which sin introduced into the world. Sin creates individualism and fragmentation, whereas grace creates communion, unity, which is authentic humanity. As communion, the Christian life is seen as being one with Christ. Just as the Trinitarian life of God points back to the unitive nature of God as divine. Does this mean that difference is eradicated? The answer is no. Difference is not to be seen as a tool for division. Rather, difference is embraced as a tool to further and foster communion of persons. Hence, Trinitarian theology states that in God's relationships as persons, difference is upheld. But in God's nature as divine, unity is sustained. In relation to the church, as individuals, we each bring to the assembly our unique traits as persons living in different social cultural contexts. But as community, we embody one heart and one soul in Christ, who is the source of our unity. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Returning again to solidarity that is enacted in and by the Eucharist, Eucharistic solidarity goes beyond anthropocentric focus. It is cosmological all the way. As the gathered assembly offers prayers to God in preparation of the altar and the gifts for consecration, Gratitude is shown to God who has blessed the land and human hands for the labor that has led to the production of the bread and wine that is to be offered to God. 
Eucharistic identity not only goes beyond the context of human to human solidarity, rather it speaks to the solidarity inherent in all of creation. Thus, to embody a Eucharistic identity is to take seriously the oneness and interconnectedness of life. Consequently, to diminish one life is to diminish all life. This understanding becomes a prophetic summon for the community to constantly look out for anyone whose life is diminished by the structures of sin and evil in the world and to help restore them back to wholeness. In the context of healthcare, solidarity involves being radically aware of what is going on in the community and in the lives of its members. It involves seeing the human person as part of the larger matrix of life playing out in the community and working to enhance human life through all the factors shaping that life. Healing is by itself cosmo-focused, even if it is directly focused on the sick person. The person is always within and existing in and through webs of relationships. A sick person cannot get better when their environment reflects and perpetuates illness. To heal the sick person, one must also address the environment. Solidarity is a summon to be prophetic through being a neighbor to all of creation. By neighbor, I mean an active embrace of the other with the intent to share life in such a manner that the other and the subject experience the fullness of life together. And I dare to say solidarity is covenantal. By this, I mean solidarity creates a bond between the parties involved in the relationship. As my fellow African theologian, Abokia Mege E. Oroboto notes, and I quote, covenant is not an impersonal pact. It is deeply interpersonal and eminently relational, unquote. Speaking of solidarity in relation to the ecological order, Oroboto also notes that what affects us humans affects our environment and vice versa. Thus, solidarity is itself existential because it points to the very core of our humanity as creatures radically connected to and dependent on the other. Should the other be diminished, we will also be diminished. Should the other, be, uh, uh, the other flourish, the same will apply to us. An African adage explains this perfectly well. Solidarity is like one being invited to a feast and giving a six foot long spoon to eat. You cannot feed yourself. <laughs> no one can feed themselves unless they feed others while also allowing others to feed themselves, to feed them. This is the bond that is enacted in the Eucharist when Christians embrace the communal identity that is enacted in and through Christ who is the source of their unity. The Eucharist speaks to the gift of life Christians partake of in Christ, the life giver. Being aware of oneself is only realized through the encounter with others that the Eucharist mediates. Hence, the subject realizes their subjectivity only within the encounter with others. This realization points not to a subjectivity constituted of individualism, rather it points to a subjectivity for the other, an ethical summon to walk and live one's life in such a manner that the other also experiences the fullness of life. In this case, the gifts and talents that the subject possesses are all meant to ensure the flourishing of life of others. This is why at the, at the end of the Eucharistic gathering, the members of the assembly are invited to go to their respective communities and reenact the fellowship of life they have become part of through the Eucharistic meal. There is nothing private about the Eucharist. The joys, the hopes realized, the healing experience, and the promise of new life that God has proclaimed over them through Christ become the examples to be emulated as the members of the gathered community encounter others in the world. The world is the communal space where this life of God is to be shared and experienced by all. In other words, a Eucharistic identity is all about taking seriously the responsibility of being an agent of life for all who exist in the world. The Eucharist is about healing. However, healing itself is not a private experience. If the human person is at its core a relational creature that is interconnected to others, then healing is always a communal reality. It is important that I pose a question here that ought to be engaged in a prophetic manner. Can we say today that healthcare is still focused on the common good? 
For over two decades, many in the United States have called for an ethical reform of our healthcare system. Again, rather than focus on the core foundations of healthcare as a source and means for preserving the common good, unnecessary politics of distraction continue to be deployed as a predictable source for changing the narrative. Many in our nation have been forgotten. Healthcare has become a means for profit making. Pharmaceutical companies do not always favor the poor and the common good in their work as producers of medications needed to restore people to wholeness. For example, India that is traditionally known for producing generic drugs that the developing countries can afford is now under political pressure since 2012 from the European Union to adopt policies that will make it impossible to continue to produce affordable generic drugs. When profit is not regulated, the poor suffer. The recent scandal surrounding the price of insulin in the United States is another example of how the poor is taken advantage of by the pharmaceutical companies. A medication that has been in existence for over 100 years is still out of reach for the poor in this country. Luckily, both the Trump and the Biden administrations worked actively to help reduce the cost of this medication. As at 2022, the percentage of Americans with diabetes is 11.3%. The question must be asked, why is it that the most scientifically advanced nation in the world has such a high number of its citizens suffering from diabetes and many uh, other illnesses that are related to lack of access to healthy food? In addressing this question, one has to constantly reflect on the common good and how healthcare must be seen as part of sustaining that good. The common good is about the flourishing of all life in society. However, for this to happen, the social structures and institutions that we partake in, for example, the government, ought to be the caretaker and preserver of the common good. Each of us is also tasked with this responsibility of being partakers, of caretakers of the common good. Healthcare practitioners have a prominent role in preserving the common good. Their ability to see the issues that affect the members of the community allows for them to be important agents of life and the conscience of society when society strays away from what is considered a healthy way of being. In conclusion, I would like to say the following. Having listened to the conversations that have been occurring over this couple of months since I started having my email interactions with uh, Dr. Erwin and also with uh, Father um, What's his name? Shay. I'm trying to understand what's the mission of this university and how it was founded. And I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to say that uh, the common, this university takes seriously the common good. The mere fact that you locate this campus where it is in Ruskin, Florida, with the history of this community, you are making a statement. You are saying that the lives of the poor, those who are vulnerable, their lives matter. They are children of God and they deserve a right to live flourishing lives. Interacting with your students since I got here yesterday, today, and also with your staff and faculty and administrators, I must say again, Gannon University is leading and is really living out that common good. Listening to just what the students are saying, and I'm really inspired. They are thinking beyond themselves. They are asking the larger, the bigger questions. They are reflecting about the future. They want to make a difference. So whatever you are doing, keep doing it. And also, thank you again, Mr. and Mrs. Orlando, for endowing this lectureship, for, to allow for scholars and also workers, everyone, to come and share their insights, to build this community of life. Because when we learn, we come fully alive. Thank you. <laughs>